Roy, thank you. And uh, the video from In Touch and what they do uh, really, really, pardon the pun, touched me in the sense of one of the things that, that our ministry is all about is being very hands-on. Um, I personally see that as a challenge to what it is we do every day. Thank you. The um, <laughs> blessing of a network, I, that was an affirmation. Uh, <clears throat> the blessing of a network is we get to speak to so many people at one time. Uh, Caleb, across the country, has a listening audience of about 14 million people every week. Our sister network of Air One reaches about 4 million people every week. Um, so how did we get there? How did we get there? The blessing, as I said, we do that. The bad part about a network is we don't get much of this. It's impossible to talk to 14 million people. So about three years ago, we began to consciously push everything out and away from us. Like we have been given gifts or we're involved in something or we're in a local community. What can we do, much like In Touch, to push back and give to that community? After all, they are supporting us. So we'll talk more about that in a minute. So how did this whole thing get started? Um, I've been there 15 years and those crazy early pictures you saw, I'm part of that. The network actually started, as the video says, over 30 years ago. One of the gentlemen in the picture is the one who started it. I was working with him at the time, uh, rock and roll on the radio in San Francisco in the 70s, and he felt God call him to do a contemporary Christian version of the station we were working at. And quite honestly, all of us thought he had fallen down Potrero Hill and hurt his head. Um, but he persisted in that. And Caleb actually started at his home in San Rafael, California. It was a not-for-profit, low-power FM transmitter uh, that he literally begged, borrowed, and stole from all of us to get it and, and get it going. And Roy mentioned challenges. It hadn't been on the air but about a year, a year and a half, and he got a call one day, and it was the fire department. And there had been a fire at the transmitter. And by the time Bob got there, the fire chief walked up to him and gave him this piece of molten metal and said, that's your fire door. That shouldn't have happened, by the way. Shows you how intense this fire was. They were, the enemy was bound and determined to get this thing off the air. Combined with that, the guy that owned the land refused to renew the lease. I don't want you people here. Go away. So the early stages of Caleb were there was content and no delivery system. Same time, there's a gentleman in Monterey, California, a pastor, had three or four little signals around Aptos and Santa Cruz and Monterey, but he had no content. And there was an engineer there who was really thinking out of the box, and he said, how can I get a signal from Santa Rosa, California to Monterey, California? And he figured out a way to do it. He was one of the first ones in the business to do what's now commonly called an STL, Studio Transmitter Link. He actually bounced it about three times over the hills and bounced it into Monterey. That was the birth of the network concept. It really wasn't called Caleb till many years later, but that was how the whole thing started. In my 15 years, what you see there is a far cry from where we started. We actually were in on market right down the street over here. We were two complexes up from the original area where the Kings played, which is now an office. And it was the most horrendous thing you've ever seen in your life. Um, it was an office. We rented office space. And of course, the suite next to you is never the one that opens up. It's down and around the corner and over there. We looked like we were so inefficient and scattered, it wasn't even funny. We got into our present building because one day, a man walked in to the front desk, and he had a roll of papers under his arm. And he walks up to the receptionist, and he just stands there. And she says, can I help you? And he said, I don't know why I'm here. And she said, okay, let's start with who are you and what do you have there? <laughs> well, I, I, I represent Stanford Ranch Development and we got some land. You want to see it? And he rolled out where Caleb lives now. Uh, to this day, he doesn't know why he came by. We do, but he doesn't. Um, we actually got the land and built the building for less than we were paying in rent. So God had his hand on the ministry from the very beginning. There were 38 of us when we started. Today in Rockland, there are about 315 and another 40 or 45 around the United States at various locations. Um, so really down to the nuts and bolts, how did we get where we are? We had to start out with a mission statement. We all stood around and went, okay, why are we here? What is it we're supposed to be doing? We came up with 
every kind of mission statement you can think of. The one you first saw, this one, I mean, we went through every, every bit of, uh, go ahead and show them, every bit of uh, conjuring that we could do. Some, we went to the, yeah, this is like a, a, a military mission statement. That didn't work for us either. Go to the next slide. This is, maybe, ah, there. that's what we came up with. Ignore this for the moment. We came up with that. And the reason we came up with that, and the reason that obviously a mission statement is important, is what are you doing? How do you get people to rally around you when they don't know what the goal is? You have to have the goal in mind all the time, and you have to be able to communicate that with people, and you have to do it over and over and over and over. Um, you have to model it in everything that you do. Everything that represents you must fit that mission statement, otherwise you're wasting your time doing it. You can make those too broad, you can make them too narrow. This, being the brilliant broadcasters that we are, this took almost a year and a half to come up with. Because everything else that we came up with, we shot holes in. This is just an explainer for us who, once in a while we go back to that and go, huh, what did we mean? That's just an explainer. But the mission statement, create compelling media, that inspires and encourages the listeners to have a meaningful, meaningful relationship with Christ, period. Let me interject something here, something I always share with the staff and everybody who works here is going, oh, he's not going to say that again. Um, God does not need us. If you ever think God needs you, obviously, you need to sit down and rethink that. He is choosing to use all of us in our own unique ways. And I'm born and raised in Modesto, in an agricultural area, so I keep things very simple and I'm a visual. So to me, what that means is you show up, you make yourself available. You do it with the best ability that God gave you, and then the real key, you get out of his way. We all, especially guys, we want to micromanage stuff. Not the way to do it. I've been there, I've done that, and I suffered because of it. And when I finally came to the realization that my personal relationship with Christ was so deep that I could give him my life, my livelihood, and my family, he just threw the doors open. And stuff began to happen that you see up here. Next beyond the mission statement is we had to have some values. Those are our values in the order that we want them in. Uh, this is kind of an interesting one here. Uh, originally, this said, and be a little wacky. Um, and we thought that wouldn't go over well with people who don't know us, so uh, we took it out. You, you, serving Christ can be a challenge. It can be hard. So my job was to create an environment and get others to begin to mirror that environment that was fun. And the way we made it fun was, is first of all, you have to be purposeful about having fun. And second of all, you have to share with them the experience of what Christ is doing because of what you do. You as a business owner or a business leader, you probably know this already, but you're, part of your job, a major portion of your job, is to reflect back on the people that serve with you what their efforts do. They automatically own it, they take rightful pride in it, and they want to do more of it, and they want to do it better. Um, the mission was the how, the values were the what. The next thing that was attacked, and you can just leave that there for now, uh, was the culture. How are we going to be as we do all of these things? We have a mission, we have values. What kind of culture? Prior to my becoming the CEO, going on six years ago now, um, the original CEO was there, and he, um, he was very textbook typical in the sense of he was an entrepreneur. And by that I mean it's top-down management. We just sort of waited to see what it is he wanted. I can't sit here and tell you it was wrong because the platform that we were able to move from was really good. God had honored that. But there is a ceiling that tends to develop with that kind of management style. To take it to the next level, and it wasn't any secret sauce on my part, it's just more where I am. I'm a bottom up. I like to find the right people, design the right job, equip them, set up metrics and get out of their way. Let them do their job. And Roy and I were talking before, again being a visual, I see this. This is what I've learned, is you gotta go like that. And you gotta let them run. You have to give them two things when you do that though. One is you have to give them the authority 
to do their job. And at the same time, and this was the hard part for a lot of them to learn, you got the authority, but you also have the accountability. So that didn't work. Okay, why? You talk about it and you figure it out. Now, I don't know what all of you do. I, for one, am blessed in the sense of God did not put a scalpel in my hand. If I make a mistake, I'm not going to kill somebody. I'm just wrong. And I can do it again. I'm blessed. So you have to give authority. You have to give accountability. And to me, what worked the most, and the only thing I can share, and I've shared it around the country with other leaders, is be what it is you say you are. Don't just talk it. Because your people are watching you. They're watching everything you do, you say, you smile, you don't smile, how you walk. Can, everybody can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? And my personal feeling, Roy's walking the walk. He's modeling to this staff, this is what you do. This is what's known as giving back. And he is blessed because of that. That's the way this thing works. It's amazing when you lock into that, and I know many, many of you have. There was a mantra when I first got there, and part of this culture change that said, we want to be the best contemporary Christian network we can be. Part of my coming in, I said, no, that's not right. We want to be the best radio network we can be that happens to be Christian. There's a big difference in those two, in the what if. Too many people, when they say, I want to run a Christian business that locks the doors down in their mind more than anything else, and the perceived side from the user's point of view of who you are and what you do. That, to me, my personal opinion, that's more you talking it. But when you say, I want to run a great business, and I am a Christian and I'm going to run it, that opens up a whole new territory for you. There's two words that we use at EMF that we never used until we adopted that, and they are, why not? That's how we got into NASCAR. That's how we got into NHRA. That's how we got into the Fan Awards. Why not? No donor dollars were used. A third party stepped up and said, if you want to do it, we'll pay for it. I have a fiduciary responsibility as people support the network to not spend money in that arena. All the money goes right back into the ministry. God provided a way to do it. But before, we would have never said, why not? And I did. I said, why not? And everybody at the station said, why not? The ministry that's happened because of that is in, I couldn't even measure it for you. Because it's a ministry of being. Really? You guys are here at the track? Well, that's cool. Can I tell you I listen? Really? You don't think Christians go to races? You don't think Christians buy cars? You don't think, I mean, what are we, some kind of weird animal here? <laughs> The Fan Awards we did in June was a real groundbreaker in the Christian community in the sense of a financial retail partnership. Pepsi stepped up and joined us and sponsored it. I had a conversation yesterday with one of their EVPs who called me and said, you want to be on one of our cans? We'll do that for you. And it's not about Caleb. It's about they saw the result of going, why not? Because we told them that's our philosophy. Why don't you think about that? And I said to this gentleman, this cost you some capital in the boardroom, didn't it? And he went, yeah. But he goes, they encouraged me to call you back. So you, the, the thing is slowly starting to turn. And I'm going to get on my soapbox for a minute. This isn't Caleb, this is me. To me, this is where the North American church is blowing it. It's not about church anymore. We have 17, 18 million people listening to us. We have 17, 18 million people who will tell us what's on their mind, <laughs> whether you want to hear it or not. And one of the things they're telling us loud and clear is, stop preaching to me. I've had enough because your talk does not match your walk. Do something. So I'll get off the box now. So one of the things was, we do things, just like Roy does. That's what they see. That's what that makes them go, ah. We have a thing at the station where I encourage the employees to go out and be hands-on in their local communities, which we do in all of our other communities, by the way, all 700 of them. We have teams that go hands-on in the community. I only have two rules that seem logical to me. I said, please don't show up doing whatever it is you do wearing a K-Love or Air One t-shirt. 
please don't show up wearing a John 3.16 t-shirt. Just show up. Because I guarantee you, when you do this, what Roy did, about the third time, somebody's going to come up to you and go, I'll come here here. Then you tell them. And that's what they'll remember. That's their biggest takeaway, is the, the world is looking for people that are willing to engage. Quit telling me about it and do something. So I can boil that down to our little world at EMF, so we're about doing with people inside the business. People say, are you a business or are you a ministry? We're a ministry that runs on solid business principles. And we'll talk about some of those in a minute. Um, we changed the mantra. To support the, the culture, we also had to learn a skill. And this was kind of a, a scary skill for a lot of people. It's called a crucial conversation. I'm sure you've all read the book or heard about it. We had to learn to, to have those because what we had was a bunch of silos. Silos uh, of expertise, but also silos of knowledge. And getting much done was a challenge. You had to walk up with a hammer and just bust the door down to get somebody in IT to talk to somebody in graphic arts. First of all, they didn't have the same language. And second of all, they just didn't. So we began a training session with every employee about how to have these crucial conversations. There are rules to them. You all know them. You all are leaders. You know how to do this. It's amazing how many people don't. <clears throat> and so it's worth your time to invest in your people how to have that. We have silos of expertise now, but they have huge doors in them that go this way. You will find people working on projects or seeking information from every dis different discipline that we have in the building without asking their manager. They don't have to do that. You have to give them the authority and the accountability that goes with it. Um, we're a service organization. We serve God. We're just one of his tools. So we, we take what we do as a service. We don't own it. Uh, everything that I've said today and you see on there, and I would encourage all of you please to come by. We'd love to have you tour the station and get to know the people. They know it's not ours. That building's not ours. I walk in there every day and I look at it and I go, no, no, we didn't do this. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, it's just a fact. We are just human beings who, we like what we do. We have fun. We're very blessed. It's hard work, but we did not do that. I'm the leader of this funny little group, but he's running the place. We have a board of directors, like any 501c3. I am their single employee. <laughs> um, everybody else is my employee. Um, we actually have a board. I, I'm, I'm so thankful and very fortunate. It's a very high-powered board, but they understand there's a huge chasm between policy and operations. They do not get into operations. They, you know, I will tell them right to their face, do you worry, Mike, that we get into your business? I said, you don't know my business. And they go, yeah, you're right. Keep doing it. <laughs> so I'm pretty, pretty uh, blessed in that area. Quick little note on how did we go from 30 stations to 700 stations? What's our expansion process like? Um, some of the other Christian ministries in the U.S. think that we hover around like a giant Darth Vader sucking up radio stations. Uh, it's not true. Uh, in the time that I've been there, we have never targeted a city or station and said we want that. They first all have to be for sale. And second of all, brokers come to us, just like real estate, same kind of thing. They don't really like coming to us because we have one little secret weapon on our staff by the name of Joe Miller. Joe beats them up price-wise. We're a 501c3. We cannot pay commercial competitive rates for properties. An example, uh, you all may or may not know in the last year we've gone on the air in New York City, which to this day baffles all of us. What is Caleb doing in New York City? God must have decided we needed to be there because we're there. When I first got the phone call from the company selling it, they wanted $60 million for it. And I literally <laughs> laughed and said, good. <laughs> you know? Well, what can you do? I said, I don't, I don't, I don't want to waste your time. And they said, no, 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 what can you do? Okay. So we have a process. We, we have a, a, quite a set of analytics we run through when we buy a property. We did it, put it in the mail, and it was like mailing it to nowhere. It was like one of those things you put in the mail and you think, did I really mail it? <laughs> Never heard anything. 18 months later, my phone rings, and the guy says, hey, Mike, can you still do that deal? 
And I said, I hate to ruin your day, but I can't say yes, I need to check something because things have changed. And our secret weapon has found out that we actually can move the station closer to New York, so there's obviously costs with that. Oh, send me those plans. Okay. A couple of days later, he calls back. He goes, we'll take the deal and we'll build the station for you. And I went, what? And he goes, yeah, done. Get your attorney on the phone. And I, he, he, I don't think he was a believer, but I remember all that came out of my mouth was, praise God. And I remember him going, yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's all he said was, yep. <laughs> That's how we got there. God knew what we could do. He made it happen. And this, this is my, per my wife will always come at me with this. This is my personal growth time, is to, I got to let go. My instincts went, no way. I would not jeopardize the ministry with that much money. I wouldn't even come close to that. God went, step aside, <laughs> and did it. That's how we grow, is that we, uh, we have managed to continue growing. There was a period where we grew about 25% a year. Um, it's down to about 17 or 18 now, but it's more of a methodical growth because we've also worked on paying down debt. It's way down. I mean, it, it, God has just blessed us to death. There have been a lot of challenges along the way. Um, I want to talk about those in just a minute. One facet that I want to tell you that's, that's come up in the last year is I've been on a, a board of directors in Paris of a group trying to get a Christian station on in Paris. And I'm on the advisory board. The, the government in Paris won't allow an American to be on the, the front line, so I was in the advisory end of it. And we tried again and again and again and again to get a terrestrial station. In fact, one of them had an antenna on the Eiffel Tower. And we thought, well, that'd be a good place to start. Uh, and we kept getting turned down. And the reason we got turned down, we finally got to a board member. They have a, the, the FCC here. Theirs is called the CSA. He came out and he told us, he goes, here's the sole reason you got turned down. In France, when you get a broadcast property, they give it to you. Whereas here, you pay for it, buy it, and build it. There, they give it to you. So one of the things they want you to prove to them is can you financially sustain this thing? We're listener supported. Those two words do not exist in France. So when we told them that, they're like, uh, no. Well, we've got a history and uh, we don't get that at all. We don't want it back. I was over there in fall of last year, and I was meeting with the guys, and I was walking down the street, and I looked, I don't know where my phone is, and that's right, keep it, and I began to notice, and I began to think about something, so I started checking it. You know the United States is one of the least wired countries on this planet. We do not have broadband zip in this country. Disaster happens, what's the first thing that goes down? every one of those phones. We did a study, I'm on the board called the NAB, National Association of Broadcasters. We did a study and we took Oklahoma City and we picked a date and we said, stop right today. All of the existing broadband devices, phones, internet, that kind of thing, don't sell anymore today. Turn them all on at once. What would the infrastructure have to look like in order for it to work? A cell tower every six and a half feet. Probably not gonna happen. Every other country never spent one dime on hardwire. They went from nothing to broadband. They are far more equipped than we are. The point of all this was, I was walking down the street and I went, you big dummy, you're trying to do something here that is right in front of your face. So we actually have launched on the internet a French version of Caleb. It's ex they love American music, and we quantified it by the number of IP addresses that are listening to us in France right now. So we feed them everything you hear on K-Love as it is today, except the announcers and the little sweepers between songs and stuff, they're in French. And it's taken off like crazy. We're going to do it in Spanish in Q4. And then who knows after that. The next actual language is Mandarin. We haven't figured out how to solve 84 dialects at this point, but um, we're working on it. But that, that's kind of an international twist to this whole thing that was right in front of us the whole time. You have to be aware of your world. You have to be aware of the things that are going on around you if you want to serve God where he wants you to be. Um, the nuts and bolts part of what we do and how we do it, the budgets. 
And the only thing I can say about that is um, we're pretty good about guardrails. Um, we, we, as a collective uh, executive council, came up with what we thought were, were reasonable guardrails to our spending and, how, and the processes that we do that and the, and the checks and balances, and we stick to them. The toughest word in Christianity is the word no. Um, Eric, by the way, told me the only reason he came is it was a free lunch. Um, Sorry about that. No, I'm not. I'm just kidding you. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, just, just whack it on the table there. Just, yeah. uh, so, so budgetary things, and, and you all know your business far better than I do. I'm just saying that when you have rules, stick to them. And that sometimes you have to learn to say the word no. No. You can't do everything. Remember what your core competency is. What's your mission? Succeed at your mission. Do less, better, instead of everything mediocre. HR, we've all got it. We operate on the three C's model. Character, culture, and competency. That's how we look at people. Is their character what fits our environment? Are they the kind of person we would want to call a teammate? What's their, uh, their, their character or their cultural fit? Now we do something that some of you may or may not be able to do. When we hire someone in a critical, mission critical portion of the company, we bring them in and actually hire them for two or three days. And we pay them for it. Because paying them for two or three days plus a ticket to come and go and a hotel room is a whole lot cheaper than getting married and trying to pay them later. Um, we involve everybody on that staff to, to interact with them. Management is usually the last to do it after they meet with the team members and debrief. What'd you think of them? What'd they say? What'd they do when they were stressed? What they talk about? Who are they? We want team members that fit. That doesn't mean we're looking for homogenized milk, but we want people on a cultural level to fit. Third one, and least, is competency. Now, I don't mean to say we hire people who are incompetent. We have a minimum standard that we look for in each job, especially job critical or mission critical. But that isn't as important to us as their character and their cultural fit. Um, ops operations, the balance between efficiency and effectiveness. We do some things that an analyst would come in and look at our operation and say, that's not very efficient. No, it's not, but it's extremely effective. You have to be able to balance those two, otherwise why are you doing it? We're not doing it. A 501c3 doesn't exist to make money. It is, exists to have a ministry impact, ours does in particular. So we want to be effective as well as being efficient. Uh, marketing, we found that the best thing that works for us, being in the world we're in, is viral, uh, person to person. And the way we really hone what we do is back to what I mentioned earlier was, boy, you've got a bunch of customers and you've got a bunch of people who love you, ask them why. Why do you like us? What could we do better? And you've got to be able to live with the answer because people will be pretty brutal. But if you really want to serve them, you better know what they want, not what you want. Nothing that happens at Kalover Air One is what I want or any other person wants. It's what the users want. It's designed solely for them. We are in the service business. Uh, <laughs> how many of you have an IT department? You want to drive them nuts? Walk into them and ask them for their best guess on something. <laughs> they will just look at you like you've stepped off the planet. You know, <laughs> IT people don't guess. Um, it was a challenge to learn that language. And once we did, though, and empowered them to step into the process and become part of the process and got their head around their a service department, the, many times people in that world I've witnessed think the whole entity kind of revolves around them. They're just a support mechanism for what really the business is that goes on. Um, we have some absolutely stinking brilliant people that work there and, and two sentences with them and I'm lost. I just believe that they know what they're doing and I push the button and it works so they must. So, um, Multi-locations, any of you have multiple locations around? What's the biggest challenge you face with it? Right. Locations like you expect it mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Anything any different? Yeah. In our case, we're a CPA firm, so standardization on the process with procedures. 
Right. Well, those two were the first two we found out. Communication and processes. And so we, we have, everything is done out of Rockland for K-11 Air One, except the two morning shows for K-11 and Rockland. They are done out of Indianapolis, Indiana. We ran across that station about three years ago. God brought it to us, and it was a real gift in the sense of we're on the wrong coast to be a network. Time goes east to west, not west to east. So our morning show is getting up at 1.30 in the morning. Can't do that very long. They begin to just act funny and do weird things. <laughs> so the station in Indianapolis came with studios. And the guy had just remodeled it with the same equipment we use. Once again, God said, follow me. <laughs> I got this. We went to 12 families three years ago and said, we got a great idea for you. How would you like to move to Indianapolis <coughs> in December? <laughs> Every one of them went, I'll go. They love it there. So we have these challenges. We had to be purposeful and intentional about it. Every day, calling them, Skyping them, face to face, do something. Because we don't ever in our language refer to it as them and us or that and here. It's Caleb. It's Air One. We want them to, in their heart, know they are part of the team. And that can get away from you real quick. And all of a sudden, well, I thought Sally said this, and I thought, you know, no. They all get the same note. They join our staff meetings via uh, internet all the time. So we, you have to work at that. Um, yeah. So where do we go from here? Um, we continually seek what God wants for us. We have human kind of plans, but the board has said to me before, what you, you, you notice I haven't mentioned the word vision yet. You want to put up that next slide? This is something that just kind of gives you um, a little view of what, in a box general sense, we, we kind of look like at the ministry. Um, it has a vision up here, but this is real, real fluid. We don't really use it. And the reason for that is simple. The board came to me and said, okay, you've got a mission, you've got values, where's your vision? And I said, well, what's a vision? And they said, what's it look like when you're done? And I said, don't ask me, ask God. <coughs> I mean, I'm not being smart, I don't know. What's it look like when we're done? I have no idea. So we don't have a vision that we live by. <laughs> we don't have typical benchmarks that Maybe some other businesses might have. I don't, I don't know. I'm the wrong guy to ask. So we continually ask God. We continually ask the question, why not? Um, and we pray a lot. The staff meets up to three times a day to pray over listeners' requests. Uh, we pray for each other all the time. We have eight full-time pastors who pray for our audience. They receive around 50,000 prayer requests a month from around the world. They do over 200,000 one-on-one phone calls counseling people wherever they are and at in their point in life. The cool thing about them is, is they never say, uh, gee, Randy, uh, I understand you're in New York. Uh, life's tough here. Call 1-800-DON'T-JUMP. They have contacts where we have a radio station. They have churches, pastors, police, fire, mental health officials, you name it, in their portfolio. I have heard them myself have their person in crisis on the phone, the first responder here and her come in the house. Many agencies, cops around the world, I used to be one of them, uh, carry their card in their wallet because they don't train these kids how to do that now. They train them how to lock people up, but they don't train them with doing Fred's dead and Mary's crying. Uh, so we have found a niche, a need, and that's another thing as a business person with a Christian mindset. What's the need? What's the need? and then go do all you can to fulfill it. So, um, The last slide, this is just something that means probably more to me than others, uh, but I try my best to live by that. It's, it's not about us. It's about what it is he's calling us to do. So, um, I hope all that rambling made a little bit of sense to you. Uh, that's, that's who we are. And again, I, I invite you to come over and, and, and hang out. Come over and see what's going on. Kick the tires, meet people. We, the, it's, a, it's a great bunch of people. So thank you very much for putting up with me. I appreciate that. Yeah. What, what Eric is asking is we're in the terrestrial radio business, and that means there's a tower. The Internet is towerless. It goes anywhere. 
that will continue to grow. Um, you read stories about the growth of something called Pandora and all of these people. Well, Pandora is losing about three and a half million dollars a year. So they're really not growing. They'd like to make you think they are. Ac Sirius XM touts how many millions of cars they're in. Can I tell you that three quarters of them are on a dock in Long Beach and unsold? Mm -hmm. They're just sitting there. Well, they're in the car, but it doesn't mean anybody subscribe to it. Um, it is the future. How much of the future? I honestly don't know. Because we're in the kind of business where you all will drive where we are. We won't tell you, no, you will listen to this, this method. In our world, when I talk to you about radio, it's really two things. It's the content and it's the delivery method. I could foresee a day when Caleb might in the future be in the content business and not the delivery business. We would use somebody else's you know, tool, if you will. It will continue to grow. It will proliferate more and more. The last NAB meeting in Washington, we had a representative from Ford there. And he said in three to five years, you can walk into your local Ford dealer, and that usually means five to seven, and order a brand new Mustang, and I don't care how much money you want to spend, you will not get a radio in it. It'll have an iPad in it. And on one of those buttons will be audio and you'll have to know where to get it and all that. So we've already made that venture into that world. We've already established a place in it. We're on iHeartRadio. We have our own apps for K-11 Air One. Uh, yeah. We, all, all, of the inter, all the international will go via internet. Internet, yeah. Um, it's the digital platform. We already have a foot in that, so. Yeah, sorry, I hit, the, I hit your button. On and that's what the noise was? Okay, good. That's acceptable. Anything else? Yeah. Can you go over some of the financials regarding, you know, type of budget and how much is supported by listeners and average donation by listeners? Sure. One hundred percent is by listeners. We get no government funds. We get no. We don't really have any large givers. Um, I would say conservatively, ninety-eight percent of our financial support comes from forty-dollar a month givers. We do two pledge drives a year of about a week each. And that's it. Um, that's how the, net, the network has grown. Uh, it's a matter of balancing expenses versus revenue. It's kind of hard to project revenue in the sense of all of our board members are business guys, worldwide business guys, so they look at projected you know, revenues and sales and stuff, and I go, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> I can't go. Look, Ken, I need you to step up and give twice as much. I'm not making budget here. Um, I don't sell cans of soup. I can't make more soup. We don't sell commercials like a commercial radio entity does, and I can either charge you more or run more of them. This is truly listener supported. So if you've listened and you know what we say on the air, it's absolutely transparently true. If this is something you like, if this is something you feel has value, pray about it, and if God prompts you, support. And that's really our model. That is, that's, everybody keeps wanting to go, really, what else is in there? Nothing. That's it. That's what God has done, and it's all Him. Have you considered other revenue? I mean, other alternative revenue options, uh -huh. or or just uh, ways to fuel it differently? Has that been part of the conversation ever in the history? We we constantly look at that, and for the most part, every time we look at it, if you go down the road with it, there's a value that we would have to give up. We can I can get done here, drive back to the station, go on the radio, and pray right now. Let's say we were for profit, sold commercial time. Uh, I made a deal with you, Scott. You represent company XYZ, and you go, you know what? I really believe in you guys. Here's $20 million for the year, okay? We're working through it. It's 11 months into it, and you come back, and you go, Mike, this, is, this has just been a home run. I mean, I can't believe the response we've gotten, the, the notoriety, all this stuff. I want to go 30 next year but could you just not mention Jesus quite so much? What do I do? I don't have to worry about that. The people that support us want to mention Jesus. They want us to pray. And I'm not suggesting that for your for-profit business, but you asked me, have we looked at? Yes, and they all have that caveat to them. What about, I was thinking more internally, creating something, a model that, that can fuel you with the same value system that exists in the organization, but you're fueling it. I mean, you're, you're yeah. the one positioning it. 
we actually have a mechanism in place for that. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, in, a, in a business term, it's called philanthropy. Yeah. It's, it's coming alongside people with the idea of there are people in the audience that have greater means than $40 a month, and sometimes they don't give because you don't ask them. And we've developed a model through friendship and through relationships to allow them to give more and different platforms rather than straight donations you know, bequeaths and dafts and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that's what you're asking. We have that. It's in its infancy, to be honest with you, though. We've always existed on the monthly giver.